Ni hao. I wish to thank all the organizers of this wonderful conference for giving me the opportunity to speak via video from my home here in drought-ridden Los Angeles, California, a mega drought that may well be the new environmental norm, both in cities and wilderness alike, one of the major stressors upon human lives and wildlife that is unquestionably calling upon all of us to come up with local, regional, and global responses that are ethical, compassionate, and science-driven. To get there, we need, I believe, to emphatically embrace the importance of biodiversity in the cities, outside the cities. Have we done that in America, in China, anywhere? The answer, of course, is complex, variable, in some, a seriously mixed bag. Suriname and Bhutan have exercised spectacular biological protocols of protection, but worldwide the average percentage of the approximately 120,000 protected areas versus the size of any given nation is about 12 percent. That is not a number to celebrate. In every case, the biological challenges posed by an ever-escalating human population of consumers who now account for over 52 percent of nearly 7.1 billion homo sapiens is challenging, particularly in light of our having usurped more than 50 percent of all terrestrial net primary production. Percentages across the more than 70 percent of an aquatic planet are unknown, but the spreading dead zones, acidification, and blanching of coral reefs are clear and present wake-up calls. For China as well, where species diversity in your country's northernmost marine biome, the 78,000 square kilometer Bohai Sea, has been well documented, with a large number of species having been declared endangered through human exploitation, from corals to mollusks to crustacea. North China Plain biodiversity data is equally problematic, both for its gaps and telling particulars. Examples include declining biodiversity at the Hangshui Lake National Nature Reserve, a scientific consensus with respect to indicator species like earthworms and coleoptera, ground beetles, that biological conservation measures are lacking in agricultural areas. The tragic death during November 2012 of 13 oriental white storks and other avifauna who died from pesticide or granuloptic poisoning at the critical Baidegang Natural Reserve. Despite such problems, the goals of engineering ecological protective infrastructure have been fully articulated in China's National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan approved by the People's Republic of China almost three years ago to this day. Animal rights movements across China are beginning to galvanize support for countless other sentient beings. But longtime urbanization is hammering home exacting challenges for the very conceptualization of the wild versus urban and suburban. What does the concept of interspecies collaboration and parity and intergenerational equity between species actually mean? It is one thing to shop for melodious crickets in a market or keep a pet dog. But what about the options for urban mountain lions in California, bears in Italy, even the pigeons of Paris and Trafalgar Square? Is wildlife to be banished from future cities other than in petting zoos? Taxonomy is changing. Genetic definitions of species and subspecies are changing, such that we are losing from city to city, culture to culture, a clear understanding of what a wild compass looks like as our competing biological altruisms become blurred. The ethical challenge escalates as humanity heads towards 9.5, possibly 10, even 11 billion people worldwide. We need new compassionate conservation guidelines for appreciating and rising to the challenge of protecting precious biodiversity, or as voiced by the late great Irish poet Seamus Haney, a day when, quote, hope 
and history rhyme. From an historic standpoint, the May 2006 European Environment Agency embrace of, quote, halting the loss of global biodiversity by 2010, unquote, did not happen. Times have gotten much worse as the sixth extinction spasm in Earth's biologic history gains tragic momentum, not just for species, but whole populations. As Dr. Paul Ehrlich at Stanford and colleagues have pointed out, the loss annually of some 16 million distinct populations is now taking place. There are well over 3,500 cities in the world, but that does not include urban clusters with populations under 50,000 people. China looks into the mirror and sees the very real likelihood that by 2025, 400 million of her population will live in cities larger than urban clusters, and nearly 200 of these sub-provincial and sub-prefecture cities will contain over 1 million residents. Not unlike the myriad edge effects of damage in any rainforest, so too these large, even megacities will exert their own impact on surrounding habitat, as has already been witnessed within the Tianjin Binhai New Area Biological Corridors. Degradations across every spectrum of life thus far studied from beetles and wading birds to earthworms. China overall has as much or more to lose in terms of biodiversity than any country in history. Consider some of the nation's basal ecological metabolism. Nearly 18 percent of the nation remains clad in forest, or 175 million hectares, 420 million acres, or nearly 700,000 square miles. Within that vast and scattered canopy exists at least 6,347 vertebrates, species including 581 mammals, 1,244 bird species, 284 species of amphibian, and 376 species of reptile. Add to that at least 20,000 Chinese marine species. In addition, nearly 8% of the Earth's plant species are represented in China, or some 30,000, a third of which are endemic. From its critical groups of endangered primates to the world's largest number of endemic pheasants and a quarter of the world's unique rhododendron species, China's native biodiversity is both impressive and hugely at risk. As the authors of the monumental book Hotspots Assess China, they identified colossal and diverse threats on all fronts, from fragmentation, mining, dams, unplanned mass tourism, grazing, hunting, deforestation, and poaching. Quote, extinction of many of the restricted range species of plants and animals, they wrote, is a realistic and immediate possibility. Indeed, among those nations with the largest numbers of threatened and endangered plant species, China ranks, ranks 14th from the bottom. For animal species, 7th from the bottom. So how do we protect the wild semi-wild and urban genomes of future evolution. A vast global ecotourism industry, its countless lures and brand names must go hand in hand with ecological managers and city planners who are looking at new paradigms from vertical agriculture and terraforming to combat heat islands across the vast topography of city rooftops powered by a future hydrogen fuel cell solar economy to all the new green corridors we are beginning to witness from Rio de Janeiro to Chicago. I hiked the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Long Valley National Refuge recently adjacent to the International Airport in Minneapolis, a spectacular riparian getaway that shares the bounty of an ecological oasis with other such protected urban areas from San Francisco, Hong Kong, Singapore, Frankfurt on Main, to Hangzhou, and hopefully Tianjin, Binhai. 23 million people inhabit the Sao Paulo City Biosphere Reserve in Brazil, from the 7,300 square kilometer Golden Horseshoe of Greater Toronto in the Niagara and Bruce Peninsulas, to London's 5,133 square kilometer Metropolitan Greenbelt, to Bangkok's Chao Phraya River, 
we are seeing a universal move by every city and county to embrace the needs of a fast-growing urban phenomenon which Chinese history is all too familiar with. Having witnessed its first one million person city in pre-Ming so-called Chang'an by 750 AD. Rome probably exceeded one million people even 850 years earlier. In North America, a squirrel could wander through the primeval forest canopies from the Northeast Atlantic, clear across a continent to the Pacific Ocean, never once touching the ground. That was then. This is now. But there is ecological entrepreneurism written all over that kind of data. One such exciting initiative is the Rewilding Europe project. Their mission founders write, quote, if wildness could be measured on a scale from zero to 10, where zero is the city center and 10 the remote wilderness, we would like to see all of them move up a notch or two or even three. From the southern Carpathians, the Adriatic coast of Croatia, throughout the Danube Delta and western Iberia. As a methodology for boosting economies, rewilding Europe cites the new climate of socially responsible investment opportunities and impact, investing, impact investing approaching a trillion dollars, abetted by innovative new tax strategies. Mozambique's capital city, Maputo, is in the process of creating Africa's most important city park, the formi, former army dump known as Malajin, the vision of His Excellency, Excellency President Armando Guebuza. It will be nearly three times the size of New York's Central Park, which sees some 30 million plus visitors each year enjoying Manhattan's premier oasis. For an ecotourist biodiversity sanctuary movement to flourish in the Tianjin Binhai New Area, Chinese conservation and business will obviously need to work hand in hand as visionary partners while the government continues to adopt nationwide strategies for identifying biodiversity rarity, setting priorities for large-scale ecosystem protections, distributing the green benefits of virtuous engagement with the natural world, impl implementing national polluter pays protocols and precautionary principles to curb air and water pollution and exacting strict monitoring and enforcement of current environmental and animal rights legislation so as to expand the circles of human compassion. With her amazing economic success and vast opportunities for international carbon credits by, mis by mitigation within China, the economics of environmental remediation and biodiversity protection suggest a critical national role for Tianjin Binhai, a statement of regional conscience that insists upon the beauty, the importance, the historic moment that is upon us to recognize that reverence for nature as celebrated throughout Chinese history is key to our own species survival. The city is a great place for courageous ideals of governance and ethics-based biotourism to take root. For sister cities to create sister parks and green wedges with specific walking paths and hiking trails in accord with the ecological GPS correlations, for example, to the migration of pollinators and vertebrates. Imagine the possibilities for rewilding Central Asia's silk routes, a vast green belt marking Marco Polo's travels from Europe to the Karakoram and onward to the east. We can use this concept to reunite cultures, literary, spiritual, and artistic, with urban beacons of historical connection according to ecological watersheds and the movement of birds, ungulates, bees, and butterflies. We can connect the dots, in other words, encompassing vast tracts of habitat, both urban and wild. It was in just this very spirit, I believe, that China's National Environment Protection Agency declared, quote, the survival of mankind cannot be separated from that of other species, unquote. Our trust in the ancient adage, nature knows best, 
is borne out by environmental and human history. The more biodiversity, the better life will be for human beings. This should be a fundamental, fundamental principle of urbanization, a critical divining rod for future ecological carrying capacity for cities everywhere. Friends, China has a supreme choice before it, a new vision that provides safe harbor for biodiversity rather than competing with it or worse, that embraces a compassionate idealism predicated upon the scientific data we now have in hand to turn the tide on species extinctions, to refurbish wetlands, expand open space, plant native species, ensure ecological integrity in every sector, and thereby indoctrinate a new generation of civic and business leaders, the ecologists of the 21st century, who will make all the difference for China's future. Hand in hand with crickets, tigers, elephants, bears, dogs and cats, children and future generations, our friends, teachers and philosophers, all of our loved ones, our grandparents, and last but not least, our ancestors, who must be wondering, are we going to get it right? I think we can. We must. Shei